Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello and welcome to today's Career Lunch and Learn program, Communicating by the Numbers, which is brought to you by the MIT Alumni Association. Today's broadcast is sponsored in part by the MIT Federal Credit Union, uh, MIT Professional Education, and MIT Sloan Executive Education. My name is Diana Chen. I am the Program Director of MIT School of Engineering Communication Lab. I'll be serving as your moderator today. The topic of today's webinar is really near and dear to my heart since the Communication Lab is an organization that's dedicated to teaching scientists and engineers how to communicate their own work more effectively. In particular, we embrace an approach that really empowers engineers to help their peers within their own communities to promote impactful communication. So our core service is training MIT graduate students and postdocs as peer coaches who help their own communities with communication. I started with the communication lab as one of the original peer coaches back when the organization launched in 2013. And I was a PhD in the MIT microbiology program. And it was my experience with seeing how transformative thinking deeply about good communication can be that convinced me to continue on as a leader of the communication lab since I completed my PhD. And I really believe that communication is a key skill that unlocks scientists to perform better as leaders, collaborators, mentors, educators, wherever their career paths may take them after being trained as scientists and engineers. I'll now explain some logistics for this event. So our webinar is being broadcast live. Throughout the program, you may submit your questions using the Q&A feature that you'll see in your Zoom toolbar. If you don't automatically see your toolbar, simply drag your mouse across the edges of your screen and it'll pop up again. For all of our listeners joining via YouTube, you may add your questions to the comments fields there. All questions will be held until the end of the presentation. I'm now delighted to introduce today's speaker, Jean-Luc Dumont. Jean-Luc hails from Belgium. He is a trained engineer and holds a PhD in applied physics, physics from Stanford University. In other words, he would like you to know that he is a nerd, just like you. And he has dedicated his career to training engineers, scientists, business people, and others in many different fields, skills in effective communication, pedagogy, statistical thinking, and related themes. Jean-Luc delivers lectures and workshops in four languages all over the world. Within academia, he has been invited to speak at 185 universities and research centers in 30 countries. Here at MIT, his IAP lectures are a perennial favorite among students. And in fact, MIT is where he has delivered the most lectures so far, 32, which is a cool number that he notes, uh, which is a cool number he notes because in binary note, notation, it is 10 to the, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, so, sorry, a one with five zeros after it. Um, in the corporate world, he has run sessions for such diverse companies as Apple, GlaxoSmithKline, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Shell, and Warner Brothers. And Overall, Jean-Luc takes an approach to communication that is really deeply tailored to STEM mindsets and STEM applications. And this is an approach that resonates deeply with us in the communication lab because it mirrors our own tagline of by engineers for engineers. In fact, uh, I would really like to recommend Jean-Luc's very beautiful and practical book, Trees, Maps, and Theorems, as the single textbook that the communication lab recommends as our favorite. And we sometimes even call it the, the communication lab Bible. So I'm very excited to hear Jean-Luc's talk today and to help field your questions for him. With that, I'll turn things over to Jean-Luc to talk about communicating by the numbers. Thank you, Diana. Pleasure to talk to MIT alumni. So you guys would like to improve your communication, huh? Okay, I don't suppose you've been waiting until today to do that. I'm sure you've been trying to locate useful resources precisely for doing that. Maybe people around you have recommended to you this little booklet, if 
the slides are coming on, just a second. There we go. This little booklet by William Strankany B. Y. that you may know, The Elements of Style. That is certainly a booklet that's been recommended to me many, many times. Now, the funny thing is, every time someone would recommend that booklet to me, I would ask the person, well, you think it's a good book? What does it say? And every time, pretty much, people would look at me and say, well, um, you, you really have to read it yourself to figure it out. They were unable to name any of the 18 elements of style that the book lists, as you can see here from the table of contents. Why is that? Well, simply because 18 is too many. Uh, too many for what? Well, too many for a human brain to assimilate. Now, it's not too many for a human brain to understand, right? It's not even too many for a human brain to remember. You can remember it in things if you set your mind to it. Like you are MIT alumni, you can do whatever you want in terms of learning. But it's too many in terms of really taking that with you, making it your own and making sure that any of these pops up in your mind at the right time as you are writing a document. So the question really we could ask ourselves is, okay, if 18 is too many, well, up to how many can you go? How many items presented together are too many items to be presented together in a useful, applicable way, remember, memorable way for the audience, in a sense. Now, I've been running training programs on presentations, papers, posters, graphs, and a number of other topics for hmm, full time, more than 25 years now. That's a question that we often have to discuss in those training programs because that will be key to structuring the content in an efficient way. So at this point, you might be thinking, all right, come on now, give us the answer, give us the number. Why do you need 40 minutes plus questions and answers afterwards just to answer a simple question like that? Well, because as usual, the answer is not that simple. I could give you just a number. In fact, I could really do that, but then the consequence of this is that it would become a dogma for you. Every time you are trying to construct your communication, you would say, oh, I vaguely seem to remember a webinar I attended when the speaker said that the maximum number of items you can put together is so much. And then you would apply it without understanding what you are doing which means in some cases you may not realize that it is no longer applicable, that it's a little more subtle, that the answer may just be a little different in different situations. So we really need to discuss that a little more subtly. I'll give you a hint already, however. It's got to do with the first three prime numbers, number two, number three, number five. How can we get to that conclusion? Three points in this presentation. First, we need to understand how the brain works if we want to understand how the brain can or cannot assimilate a number of items presented together. We will want to keep things global as opposed to sequential. Second, we will want to go away from making long chains of information and do something more hierarchical. We would want to build a tree with the information that we present. So keeping it global and building a tree will be the essence of it. And as we discuss that, we are going to mention numbers, limits, uh, superior, inferior limits here and there. That may not be the most memorable way to get there. So a third point will be to go systematically through the digits from zero to, or oh, let's stop at seven, and see if we can at least remember something about each one of them. First thing, brain processes, well, basically, we process information with our human brain in two different ways, either globally or sequentially. The sequential one is the one that you might actually know best because that's text, right? If I give you a, a paragraph such as this one or just a sentence, well, in English, you would have to read it from left to right and from top to bottom, one word at a time. That would take a while. Let's disclose this sentence progressively. What it says is that today, as I was finalizing this presentation, notice you already have one third of the sentence and you still have no idea whatsoever what it is that I'm trying to say to you. You have some context and that's all. You don't have the subject, you don't have the verb. Here they come. I decide it. That's the subject and the verb. Do you see now what I'm trying to tell you? I doubt it. Let's go further. Oh, another verb to add. Okay. 
a slide. Now you have half the sentence, but it's not like you have half the meaning. You've got some information, but you still don't really know what I'm trying to tell you. When I decided to add a slide on the difference, guess what, between sequential and global processes. See how slow that is? See how sequential that is in a sense one at a time? See how at the end you may have understood the idea, but you never had a, an overall idea when you started to read. That's totally different from global processes, an example of which would be looking at a graph. See this little graph here? You could look at it for just half a second and you would know. Right? I could make that test, I could show it to you for just half a second, take it away and ask you to take a piece of paper and a pencil and draw the graph and I bet all of you could do that. Right? In just half a second, that's global. Now, global information, global perception, global brain process is fundamental for structure. And you know that if you are a little bit aware of how you process information. Suppose I give you a a research paper to read, you are probably going to do a lot of global perception before you absorb the values details sequentially. You will probably flip through the pages of that paper just, just to see, to see what it looks like, possibly to see how long it is, to see how intimidating it looks. Is it full of equations? Is it full of complicated tables or graphs? And then you would read the abstract maybe, which is also a global view. We need the global view. What has that got to do with how many numbers we can process together? Well, that's a fun part in the training programs I run on oral presentations, right? It's the fact that when people create a presentation, they have an opening at the beginning and a closing at the end, but in between, they really make a chronological story usually, which if you think of it, is a secret. And I'd like to ask them the question, well, how many points, how many points maximum would you put in the body of the presentation? And it never fails. There will be a participant looking at me a little confused and saying, well, doesn't that depend on the length of the talk? I mean, if the talk is short, you would have just a few points. If the talk is longer, then you would have many more points. And they are all surprised when I say to them, no, that is not the way you would structure a presentation effectively, right? Because the number of points that you include will make a difference in terms of whether people perceive globally or sequentially. You want a, a simple reference point for that, that would be to see how many items you could have so people know how many items there are without having to count. Right? It's not an objective in itself, but it's an indication of global processing. So if I take my uh, short presentation there that I discussed a second ago, well, you wouldn't need to count. You take one look at it and you go, okay, that's just three items. That means even though it's a little chain there, it's global processing by and large. The other example I give you with a longer presentation, well, this time you would have to count in order to determine that we have seven items as opposed to three items. But the question is, where's the limit between the two? When do you stop being able to know how many there are without having to count? Well, let's make a test and you can almost tell me yourself, right? So three, you can say without having to count. Four, I suspect you can also say without having to count. Five, that would be a little more difficult, but I suspect you can. You can still see that there is a central one, there are two extreme ones and two in between the center and the extremes. At a glance, you would just still see that you have five items. I don't think that would be the case anymore with six items. You would probably have to start counting if you have six. I mean, probably because we're talking human brains, so we have to take variability into account. And some human brains are capable of incredible things. You may remember the movie Rain Man, in which Dustin Hoffman plays an autistic savant, and he was able to look at a deck of cards and you remove a few and he can tell you exactly what's left in the deck of cards. He would be able to do more than, than just five. But that's the exception. The rule is much more, at least based on 25 years of discussing this with groups, that the limit would be five. One, two, three, four, and five to see how many they are without having to count. Six and beyond, you would have to count. 
difference between global and sequential processing. Now, if any of you has children, especially young children, you can see this very, very strongly in a developing child. I remember when my son was two and four months. I remember because that's the day he took me to the zoo for my birthday, how nice of him. And at some point in the distance, we saw camels. So I pointed that to them, uh, to, to him and I said to him, hey, look over there, camels. And he looked and he said, yes, three. So I was telling this story a little later to my mother, you know how grandmothers are, right? She went, oh, this is amazing. He can count to three already. And I thought about that and I went, um, no, he can't. He can say three, but he cannot count. Counting would be going one, two, three. He wasn't able to do that until he was almost four years old, right? That's the difference. Now, don't get me wrong. Being able to say how many there are is just an indication of global processing. It's not a goal in itself. In every training program, there will be one participant to tell me, oh, you know, you want to present seven items? Just number them so people know at a glance how many there are. That's not the point. In a sense, what you want is to be able to handle all the items in a random order, in any sequence. That would be true global processing, as opposed to a predetermined sequence. Example, suppose I give you three colors, red, white, and blue. Here's the exercise. I'm going to give you two out of the three in random order, and you have to tell me as fast as possible which one is missing. Are you ready? Blue, red. Well, you have been thinking white so fast and so loud that I could kind of hear it through the internet. That's obviously the missing one. You, you cannot miss that one. I do this in training programs with four things, north, south, east, and west, the four cardinal directions. I give them three in random order, and I ask them to say as fast as possible which one is missing. It's striking how their mouth is too slow for their brains. They have the answer immediately, and then it takes a while to, to blurt it out in a sense. Okay, that's the red, white, and blue. Try this with the seven colors of the rainbow, at least as they were defined by Isaac Newton quite a while ago. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. I'm going to give you six in random order to tell me which one is missing. Blue, green, indigo, orange, red, violet. Well, you might be fast, but the process would probably be different. I bet some of you are starting again from the start and say, okay, red is in there, orange is in there, yeah, yellow. Yellow is not in there. Yellow is the answer. See now why the cutoff is so sharp between five and six? You could say, look, when we go from five to six, the only thing we do is add one compared to five. That's plus 20%. Multiply by 1.2 if you want. But that's not what really matters for the brain processing. What really matters is that in terms of combinations, we are going from factorial five to factorial six. And so the factor there is not 1.2, the factor is six. That's why the cutoff is so sharp. Consequence, for an effective structure, convey no more than five items together. That means five points in a presentation like we've been talking about all along. It also means if you have a bulleted list, no more than five items in the bulleted list. Now, here's the first case where you have to be really careful not to misinterpret what I'm saying, not to apply it blindly. I've seen people tell me maximum five items in the list and maximum five words per item in that list. And that is nonsense because five words are not five items presented together. There is a substructure, there's a hierarchy between the different words in the sentence. Five items that would work. Don't worry about the number of words. Otherwise, you might as well say no more than five letters per word. Total nonsense, obviously. You can also apply the number five to the number of lines in a graph. No more than five lines that would work. Well, just work because we said this is the maximum, right? Five is already quite a few. It's a handful, actually. It's the five fingers you have on your hand. Is that related to the limit in our mind? I don't really know. But one thing I can tell you is that five fingers is already a lot. In comic strips, many characters from, from Mickey Mouse to um, Calvin and Hobbes only have four fingers because five begin to be difficult to draw properly, right? So four fingers in there, which means, yes, five is the maximum. Five is not the optimum. 
that's an interesting moment in our training programs as well. When I ask them the maximum number of points, they don't really know. But when I ask them the optimum number of points, they always know. They tell me, oh, the optimum is three. Why is it three? Well, it's difficult to have a simple answer to that, but we can work by progressive approximations. What's wrong with two? Two is a dichotomy. Two is an opposition, a black and white, night and day, good and evil, yin and yang. So in a sense, it's only one concept with a bit in front of it. You have it or you don't have it. So you could say, okay, three is better, it's richer, but then four is even better. Well, four is even better, except that it's so many already that it's starting to invite a substructure. You give four items to people, very often they start grouping the items, two and two, or maybe three and four, they see a substructure in there. So what's the advantage of three? Well, three is the simplest complexity. It's complex enough in the sense that, let's say, it introduces a gray between the black and the white. It's not a dichotomy anymore, but it's the simplest way to be complex. It's simpler than four, and so it works well as in optimum. You don't believe me? You, my argumentation doesn't convince you? Well, go for empirical evidence there. Just see how many things work in three. When I grew up, the one reference point I had was an old black and white movie that my grandparents would show on their movie projector called The Three Little Pigs, obviously. And you have many more than that. Some of you would think spontaneously maybe of The Three Blind Mice or The Three Wishes in Aladdin or The Three Fairy Godmothers in Sleeping Beauty or The Three Bears in Goldilocks which is an interesting one, right? Everything in Goldilocks goes with three. The first uh, cup of porridge is too hot, and then the second one is too cold, and the third one is just right. So it shows you that it's by no means limited to folklore. Go to philosophy. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis, rings a bell. Well, there you have the three. Music. Good friend of mine who has been very meritoriously trying to teach me the fundamentals of music always said, well, you play a theme, you repeat the theme, and then you do a variation on the theme. And that's, again, the number three that you see there. You know, the, the craziest example I ever heard from a training participant in the workshop, that person said, the United States Declaration of Independence. What about three in there? Well, let's read it, shall we? We hold these truths to be self-evident. One, that all men are created equal. Two, that they are endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights. And three, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So we've got three truths. We also have three unalienable rights that are given as an example, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And she said, she said to us, life, that's clear. Don't kill people, at least not arbitrarily. Liberty, that's clear as well. Don't imprison people arbitrarily. But the pursuit of happiness, what exactly is it that you're not supposed to do? That's a very fuzzy one, she said. She's just there as a placeholder. Because if you say life and liberty, that's not good enough. You need a third one, and that's why we have the pursuit of happiness. Well, right or wrong, it's a view of the mind, of course, because that's what it really is, right? Structure is a view of the mind. It's always possible to structure the same content in different ways. Structure does not pre-exist. Don't come and tell me, oh, but I have 18 points. That's the way it is. No, that's the way you look at it. So let's sum up this first part by saying, ideally, for memorable stories, you would have three points. But it's not a dogma. So if you've been thinking about it, if you've been considering three points and you say, you know, in my specific case today, I think two would work better, or four, or five, then of course, by all means, go for two, or four, or five. Don't think you should be obsessed with number three. However, if you tell me, you know, in, for my presentation today, seven would be the better number of points, then I'm going to say, ah, I'm really not sure about that one. I really try hard never to say never, but in this specific case, I may want to say, oh, I really don't think that you want seven points presented together. So the next question, if you have seven things you want to say, then what do you do? That's the second point. You will want to build a tree. Before we really build it, let's do something simpler than a tree. Let's start by just grouping. As we've said before, 
if I give you this many points, you would have to count to know how many they are. Well, unless I group them. Now you immediately see three groups of three items. And if you are an MIT alumni, <laughs> then you know that three times three is nine. So you would see here what the total number is because it's been grouped. With, of course, conditions, everything we said before applies at two levels. First, make sure that when you are going to organize the items into clusters, you have no more than five items in every cluster. And of course, you have no more than five clusters. Otherwise, you would violate our little rule of thumb in one of possibly two ways. You know where you can apply this in a very simple way? It's big tables. See this table here in a training program on page layout? I would point out that this table has got a lot of useful ink, that's the data, and a lot of unnecessary ink, that's all the horizontal and vertical lines. You could remove that because it's one thing that the audience otherwise would have to process, and they lose time. But then people tell me, well, you know, then it's difficult to make the correspondence between an item in the left column and an item in the right column. You almost have to take a pencil and you have to follow on the pencil to make the correspondence. Well, the way it is, yes, but not if you decide to group the items, for example, in this fashion. Now, even though we don't put horizontal lines anywhere to connect, we can easily make the match between an item in the first column and an item in the last column, right? If the data in your table is undifferentiated, this is just basically the same variable for lots of different situations, then you could group in equal clusters. In this case, we group by five because that's the maximum. You may have seen this. You may have seen this in, in train timetables, for example. Maybe they were even using a background color there to help you figure out the clusters in the table. That's what you do if the data are undifferentiated. Of course, sometimes it's not the case. If you say these are actions that I want my audience to take, there might be a more meaningful way to make clusters than just count five, skip some space, and then count another five after that. Of course, try to make it as meaningful as possible. Which means maybe we should go away from this vertical presentation as a chain. And instead of that, we would move from a chain to a tree. Even for a small chain that is less than five or maximum five, we could think of it as something that is subdivided in three, again, uh, in a sense, in random order. It's not two after one and three after two, even if it happens like that in the presentation. In the end, of course, it's I have a main point at the top and I have three different arguments almost in any order in this situation right here, right? I have a main point, if you want, one, and then I have two, three, four, maximum five points to support that main message up there. And now we can revisit the question I had before. How many points in the presentation? Well, imagine you went somewhere outside of your organization. You went to a conference or to a client or to some sort of event, and you gave a brilliant presentation in 15 minutes. And a colleague from your organization attended that and loved it and says to you, you know, when you're back at our organization, would you come and give that talk to my division? But you know what? Instead of 15 minutes, you can have half an hour. What do you change to the structure when you go from a short presentation to one that's double as long? Well, you don't change anything to what you already have. That's the point. If you have a main message, and in this example, three main points, you keep that. However, you will have more to say about each of these main points, which means if you have more to say, you may want to structure it again in sub points. Right? That's a tree. That is more than just clusters like we had before. It's really something where you could have information at every level. It's very striking in written documents when you have a section, section four, before you have subsection 4.1, you can put something global there. There's no rush in dividing, right? So we need to balance that three as best we can. Let's remind ourselves of what we already know, because I see so many people who are afraid of hierarchies. Paradoxically, people who have studied communication, they are the editor of a newsletter, they want to 
keep it simple as they tell me. And so they have an article in there and they say, no, we don't want a hierarchy. We just want one level of heading, no more than that. And whenever you need one, you put one. You don't even have to number them. Then they have a document with lots of headings, nine in this case. And as we said, that's not going to be memorable, not something you can easily assimilate, not something you could derive a global view from. You cannot just skip to the pages and say, oh, I see. You wouldn't see anything. So we said it before, but let's repeat it. Every cluster in our tree should have a maximum of five items. Of course, don't get carried away the other way, right? When people understand that they could put sections and subsections, sometimes they exaggerate a little bit. It's not infrequent that in the document, at some point I would see a heading that is numbered 3.4.1.5.2, right? What's the idea of this decimal notation, by the way? Why don't we use, like in the old days, Roman numerals, then capital letters, then Arabic numerals, and then lowercase letters? Well, because if you open the document at random and you see B, you don't know what it is the B of. If you put the numbers like that, then you would know. But then the point is that in your mind, you can have a global view. You can see, I see the whole document. I see the whole map. And in that map, we are right here. You would not be able to do that with five levels. I asked my training participants, how many levels maximum in our tree structure here to keep it balanced? Well, everyone says maximum three levels, now, except those who already had five or six and try to negotiate four, but by and large, people agree on three levels, right? Now, don't think this is uh, as limiting as it seems. And people who write a PhD thesis, they tell me, wait a minute, it's going to be a long document. And look at your rules here, maximum three levels, maximum five items. I'm not going to go very far with that. No. Well, then, how about we do the math? In a PhD thesis, you could have five chapters. In a chapter, you could have five sections. And in each section, you could have five subsections. That means a total of 125 subsections. So the rules of thumb here are not going to cramp your style. Right? Still, if you have a balanced tree, you will have to worry about navigation of the tree. So in a written document, you probably put a table of contents. See, this is a table of contents for a structure that respects what we said. We have maximum five in every cluster, and we have three levels. That doesn't mean for navigation, it gives you the global view. I doubt you can look at this table of contents and say, oh, I see at a glance. Maybe your PhD thesis had a table of contents on four pages. How is that giving a global view to anyone? Well, you know what you can do? For the table of content, not for the document itself, just for the table of content, you can do minus one. Only show the chapters and the sections. You still have subsections, you don't show them in the table of contents, right? So you do minus one when you go from content to outline, to table of contents, in a sense. And if you're sorry that you lost the third level, you can certainly put it back, but, but not here. Table of contents, you put the chapters and the sections. In a sense, at the beginning of a chapter, you could put the sections and the subsections of that chapter. Like a hierarchical menu on your computer, you see the submenu of the item where you are. You don't see all the submenus at the same time. It's the same idea. Now, beware, this is for documents. If we go back to discussing presentations, then we also have to do minus one for each of them. In a presentation, don't go with three levels. You have main points and sub points, like we have on the diagram on this slide. That's all that you can have. And if you do a preview of that, put only the top level, like I'm doing right now to announce the third point in this presentation. Three points, I'm only showing you the top level. So we discussed everything we have to discuss in a sense, but now we need to sort that out, right? Let's worry about the numbers. And before we go to seven, let's just start from zero to six taking a die as an example. This might just be where all of you are thinking, wait a minute, he said maximum five and now he's showing seven of them at the same time. You're absolutely right. We need to group, but I cannot just group by leaving some space because it's a little more complex here. The first group we could make is the basis of arithmetics is the zero and the one, we'll discuss them. The next group I had announced is the first three primes, two, three, and five, 
And then whatever is left will be the first two composites numbers in there, four and six. Let's go. Number zero, what is that useful for? I mean, if you have zero content, you're not going very far. Well, remember my example with the unnecessary ink in the table. Zero is for perfection. Zero is for not giving the audience anything that they don't need. That would mean zero superfluous words on a page, zero useless gestures during a talk, zero unnecessary ink in a graph. Zero is perfection. One, one could be focus. You know, when I ask my training participants how many items maximum in the presentation, there will always be a person to say one, one maximum. And that is to the point, and besides the point, it's to the point because yes, focus suggests one team per document or per presentation, but it's besides the point because I was not talking about the presentation as a whole, I was talking in the sense of one level down the main points in the presentation. You can carry that over to lots of different situations, one message per slide, one message per paragraph, and one idea per sentence, same thing. One is more than focus, one is also consistency, right? Imagine you have a bulleted list that you think is optimal because it's got three items, you're giving the qualities of a system and you say, as a first bullet, the fastest system we test it, as a second bullet, flexible, and as a third bullet, this is a system we can rely on. Well, you've got three qualities of the system, but have you noticed how they're not expressed consistently? The first one is a noun phrase, the second one is an adjective, and the third one is a full sentence. Consistency means once you determine that you really have a list, items are comparable, they have the same type, then express them in the same grammatical form. Say the system is fast, flexible, reliable. Adjective, 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 in a sense. You could do the same for anything visual, and notice that this time we go from a single arrow to a double arrow. The one you know is all the headings of level one in your document should be typeset in the same way. And all the headings of level two in your document should be typeset in the same way, that's consistency. Well, if you really want to be helpful to the audience, you also have to make sure that the, number, the level one headings and the level two headings are typeset in different ways. So one function, one format, one format, one function. No two functions with the same format, but no two formats for the same function goes both ways. You can even do that for synonyms. Synonyms is the easiest way to lose less specialized readers. You talk about plastic solar cells, and then you talk about organic solar cells, and then you talk about polymer solar cells. Actually, even specialists will wonder if you mean exactly the same or almost the same, or in fact, <coughs> not the same, right? One word, one concept, one concept, one word. So it means no synonyms. It also means no homonyms. Ideally, that would help automated translation, but I know it's not entirely under your control. That's zero, and that's one, the basis of arithmetics in the sense that if you've got the zero and you've got the one, you can do anything else with just a scaling. Let's go further with our number theory here and go to the first three prime numbers. Let's especially discuss number two a little more. What did we say already? Two is a duality, right? Black and white, yin and yang, night and day, with all the power of it, with all the limitation of it. I use that all myself in training programs. I talk, for example, about audiences that are experts and audiences that are non-experts. You could say that's really useful. You could also say it's a limitation in the sense that sometimes I want to talk about the audiences that are in between the two like the boss of your box. That's probably not an expert anymore in your eye, but not quite a non-expert either. So we'll need to navigate that duality. We said that, I'm just summing it up. We also said that two is a useful limit. We said it's the maximum number of levels in the presentation. We said it's the maximum number of levels in the table of contents in the written document. What we did not say, and let me insist, it's also the maximum number of lines of text that an audience will process in a visual medium. You may have noticed that the messages I put on many of my slides, top left, are always on maximum two lines. Sometimes I feel with three lines, I could be just a little more accurate, but I'm very, very worried that you wouldn't process those three lines. You would just move on to whatever else is on the slide, not reading the text. Now, one thing we did not discuss about number two is that two is also redundancy. Example, we worried about eliminating distractions with rule number zero, right? Perfection. 
But in a webinar like this one, there may be lots of distractions at your end. Maybe a colleague is entering the room, maybe your phone is ringing. There might be losses, right? I said something, you missed it. What I can do is try to compensate for the losses by saying it twice, but not saying it twice verbally, right? I'm going to say it in different channels. I say it with my voice, I write it on the slide if it's important enough, which means up to a point, you could understand even if the sound of your computer is not working, you could understand even if you are just listening to this webinar without looking at my slides, that should still work, right? Two is redundancy. Three is the simplest complexity, we said that, and three is both an optimum and a maximum. In terms of numbers, as a factor, if you want, three is the optimum. Three reasons to do something would be memorable. But if you're thinking levels in a document, you think of the number more as an exponent than as a factor, and then three would be the maximum as an exponent. And five, we said it as well, it's a handful, which means it's a really useful upper limit on the number of items that you can present together. You want to remember something from this presentation, two, three, and five would be my choice, two for effective redundancy, three as typically an optimum, and five as a typically a maximum. So what about four and six? Well, those are composite numbers, they're not prime numbers. You could start by saying four is just after three, and six is just after five. So if it works in three, maybe it just works in four, at least for some people. Is it really forbidden to have four levels of headings in the document? I'm not going to say that. I wouldn't do it myself. I don't want to take the risk, but it might just work the same way that six items might just work. I wouldn't do it, but it might. Still, if they're composite numbers, then we can use the composite properties, right? Four is a square in the sense that it's two times two. So four is my recommendation for the number of choices if you let an audience choose like on, on a survey. For the training programs that we run, we ask participants to fill out a little survey online. And we've got four choices, excellent, good, fair, poor. When I give you the labels, I don't think it really matters because what people do when they have four choices is that they make a cascade of two binary choices. First, they decide if it's rather good or rather bad. And if they hopefully decide it's rather good, the next question is a little good or very good in a sense. Boggles my mind that in the social sciences, many researchers will use, will use a seven point scale. Boggles my mind because when I'm a reviewer of their papers, I notice that even though they give seven options, like very good, good, somewhat good, neutral, somewhat bad, bad, very bad, when they report on that, they make clusters. They say 43% of the respondents indicated either good or very good. But if they're going to group in the way they report the results, they might as well group on the scale that they use. Powerful. You could use five if you want a neutral in the middle of it. I don't like a neutral. I want to force people to make a choice. I'll go for four. That's useful for number four. I don't really know what to tell you for number six. It's really just a composite. Well, you could have six graphs. For example, you do something that's related to the weight of people in the life sciences. Well, you could have a normal or acceptable body mass index, or underweight and overweight. And in the other direction, you could say, let's make a difference between males and females. You would have a display of six graphs, like you have the six dots on the face of the die here. But basically what we are saying there is that six is not interesting in itself. What's interesting is the substructure, in other words, the prime numbers that we discussed before. Now, remember when we looked at folklore to realize that three was the ideal number? That's another great moment in the training programs when I ask participants to mention what goes in three in fairy tales, and they say the three wishes in Aladdin, the three godmothers and fairy godmothers in Sleeping Beauty, and then someone will say, oh yeah, what about this one? What about the seven dwarfs? Well, seven is an interesting number as well, but in a negative kind of way. Do you even remember the names of the seven dwarfs? You used to know them, maybe, or you know some of them, the most colorful ones, but it's not easy unless you remember them in a specific sequence, right? In a sense, you could say seven is the smallest numerousness. Why seven dwarves? Because they wanted to say 
there were a lot of draws, but they wanted to say a lot in the most economical way possible. And then seven is that number. It's the smallest way to say that we have very many. So it's not terribly useful in general for the kind of communication that you would do professionally. OK, so we discussed it. <clears throat> Keep it global. Keep it a tree, a hierarchy, and not a chain. And recognize that from zero to six, any number could be a useful guide. Don't go towards dogmas when you just remember one number and apply it inconsiderately. Structuring, to finish, is a powerful device for communication. Let me end with just a specific example. A number of years ago, I was asked to give a presentation. And they say, as a topic, we would like a personal efficiency, time management, if you want, which is not a topic that I had in my repertoire. So I thought about it and I said, OK, I'm not an expert about it. Plus, we are in the information age. What do they need me for? They want help on personal effectiveness. They just put that in their favorite search engine. What's the problem with that? Well, the information age is really the age of the information overflow, right? Last time I looked, I had more than 30 million hits. Or you could say, well, OK, let's take the first three. When I had one that I thought was interesting, it's this page here that had 33 recommendations for personal efficiency. 33 in volume one. Look at the bottom of this list, and you see that it goes on with another 33 in volume two and another 33 in volume three. That's 99 tips. All of them useful. Don't get me wrong. That's where I thought, oh, I can see what my value added could be. The value added would be selecting and structuring. And the way I did that, actually, this is the, the last talk I gave at MIT last January. I structure it with something that you probably recognize as well. The expected gain is the return you might get on a given outcome multiplied by the probability that you get that outcome summed over all the possible outcomes. It's a way to structure, right? So I decided my outline for that presentation was going to be what's desirable, that's the return, what's achievable, that's the probability, and then how do you combine the two and actually make it happen, right? Which means not only it was going to structure everything I was going to say in that presentation, the goal was also that this model could help the audience structure everything they would ever read or hear in the rest of their lives about personal efficiency. I know, if you're an MIT alumnus in particular, you probably have a lot of content expertise, and that's something you obviously bring to the communication. But the other thing you might bring, the communicative value you might add, is by selecting among everything you could be saying, organizing what you would have selected. The third one that we did not discuss in this presentation would, of course, be expressing it. But structure means select and organize. Just by doing that, on top of all the expertise you already have, you bring so much to the audience. Let me leave you with that thought and close this presentation in a way that I know is not very original, but believe me, it's very sincere. Let, just me, me, let me just wish each and every one of you every success with your communication in the future. Perhaps I might just add one little practical thing and then I give the word back to Diana. Diana mentioned my book. Well, just because you listen to me today, you can get the book at a discount. Make a note of this page or make a screen capture if you want to using the code that you see there on the screen at that URL until the end of October, you can get 25% off. That's just the practical thing. Bye now, back to you. Thank you very much for that generous offer, Jean-Luc. And thank you very much for your presentation. I really like the cognitive emphasis that you had here on what the audience can actually process or uh, understand in one glance, because I think it reminds us that communication really doesn't work unless it is processed in the mind of the people who are listening to us. So it's never just a passive act of handing something off, but there has to be processing on the other end happening. So now I will turn to our listener questions, and I'll remind you that if you weren't aware before, there's a Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen, and I'll be paying attention to the answer, the questions that pop in and fielding them for Jean-Luc. So the first question I'd like to direct to you, Jean-Luc, is how long can a sensible presentation be where sensible means 
the me message has been given and the audience is still interested. So, right. That's a question that I have a lot uh, indeed, uh, in particular because they are myths. I keep hearing people saying, oh, you know, after 10 minutes, it's hopeless. The audience will no longer be interested. The audience will just uh, disconnect from the audience. And I disagree with that very strongly for, for a simple reason, because you and I go to the movies. Movies are typically at least 90 minutes. If it's any shorter than 90 minutes, you feel cheated. And a good movie can keep your attention for 90 minutes without any problem. Now, I can answer that question with my personal experience, including the talks that I give at MIT. I regularly give lectures that are two hours. In two hours, I maintain that I can keep the attention of the audience nonstop from the beginning to the end. More than by structuring the content in a well-balanced tree, there's also a lot about the delivery, the modulation of the voice, the eye contact, the body language, but two hours I can do. I would not venture longer than two hours myself, if only because then the audience may just need a restroom break or something. We start hitting uh, physiological limitations of the audience that have nothing to do with their brain in a sense. Now, it doesn't mean that two hours will work for you, but it means that you should not give up from the start and listen to that nonsense. You can give long presentation and keep the audiences interested. It's not automatic, but you can. Great, thank you. So another question that I see popping up a lot is that there are many instances where the number 10 feels very appealing. For example, lists of 10 things, or apparently a net promoter score that is based on a scale of zero to 10. Can you comment a little bit about why the number 10 f seems to feel so appealing to people and whether you would recommend for or against using that number? Right. The, the number 10 is appealing because the number 10 is the base that we are using for writing numbers. And I suspect the base comes originally from the fact that we have 10 fingers. You could also have a number 12 base that's still used in some British and American units, which then would be, be based on the 12 pieces of fingers that you have on one hand if you are counting with your finger like this. So I really think it's about the base. A, a friend of mine who is studying these things always says that given the base, like 10, we will certainly use that to round things off. And we would be sensitive to the base, twice it, half of it, and possibly half of half. And you see this very clearly in, in currency systems. In Europe, it's really twice and half, right? If we have 10, then we have five, and we have 20, which means you can multiply all that by 10 or divide all that by 10. We would have two, or we would have 20 cents. We wouldn't have 25 cents like in the US. The US has a system where you take half, and then you take half of half, and you have a quarter. Now. Maybe we didn't do such a good work if we, when we chose the base 10 to do everything, maybe we should stick to something that is simpler than the base 10. So I suspect that the appeal for 10 is just a round off appeal that is based on the base that we have chosen. You know, uh, to take a, a religious example, many of the points I made could be illustrated by religious examples, like number three in Christian religions, the three kings, the Holy Trinity, the, the three denials of Peter, and so on. Sometimes, if you're strongly religion, you could feel that my talk goes against the Ten Commandments. Now, look at every illustration you've ever seen of the Ten Commandments. It's two tablets. It's two tablets of five. Right? So in a sense, there's been a grouping of the Ten Commandments in five and five, which brings us back to the points I was making in this presentation. Excellent, thank you. Next question. Several people would like you to expand on the use of trees in a presentation. So for example, should the, visual tree, should the tree be made visual and apparent during the presentation? Is it something that should just stay implicit in how the presentation is structured? What do you recommend? Right. Well, the answer to almost any question that the attendees are going to ask me today is, it depends. It depends on your content. You may have noticed in this presentation, for example, I only previewed the three main points. I had a slide that kept coming back with a different highlight every time where we are on the map. Could you do for a presentation the same as I suggested you might do for a document, which is preview the sub points? Now you could. 
One way to do that is to preview the subpoints at the beginning of each point. So let's see if I can make a hand gesture here. Yes, you've got your three main points on your slide. When you start point two, you could have a, a little line that comes to the side and the three subpoints of you of point two, only of point two, showing up. And then when you come to point three, you would have the subpoints of point three. Why would you or why would you not do that? Well, you have to consider what the value added it represents for the audience. If the subpoints are, are really different things, you really want to say in point two, I have three very different things that I want you to remember, then previewing them is likely to be very useful. In the current webinar that I've been giving, that was not terribly useful. Whatever I was covering under point one was kind of fuzzier. I could have previewed it, but the benefit would have been minimal in terms of what I believe the audience should remember. If you believe they should remember the sub-level in terms of structure and, and carry that with them and assimilate it, then you probably want to, preview, prevent, uh, to preview the sub-level as well. Now, in your question, you said, can we do that graphically? Should the tree be shown? Yes, in a sense. At least if you are going to use slides, you don't have to. You can give great presentations without slides. But if you are going to go use slides, then use the visual power of the slide to make that tree structure, main point and support as visual as you can. It's really going to help the audience because then they can even see where they are in the tree structure without reading. They don't even need to read the words on the slide. They can see, okay, we are at the third point out of three, it's almost done. Excellent. So we also have several questions about the application of these concepts to creating visuals. So for example, would you also say that these rules are, or recommendations apply to the number of subplots within a given figure? Well, when it's visual, you have to be a little more careful, but uh, in first approximation, the answer is, is yes. Now, remember that if you have more, you can show a structure. Remember my example, when I had six graphs, right? I had males and females horizontally, and I have normal body weight, underweight, and overweight, whichever way you define that with the body max index, maybe. Then you have six panels. So is six okay? Well, yes, because it's not six, it's two times three. Those are different panels. Some of you would consider that different graphs. Well, within the same graph, if you have subsets or clusters, you probably want to do something similar. Uh, I say probably because it will depend on your data set. But again, if the goal is for the audience to take that away from your presentation, you will have to be careful how much you give at a given time visually as well. Great. And one question that we often hear a lot in the communication lab as well is, how do you navigate the balance between making a presentation suitable for in-person presentation where you have a lot of figures, but at the same time, you might also want for it to be able to stand alone for later reading, perhaps reference as a handout, for example? Yeah, right. I do not like the question because you are not going to like the answer. And the answer is, it's hopeless. I see pretty much every corporation where we run training programs doing it. They make slides that also double up as the written report. I see it work nowhere. If you want something that people can look at while they are listening to you, then you need to limit the amount of information, in particular the amount of text that you put on the slide. You could have a lot of visual things possibly, but not too much text. In contrast, if you want the document to stand on its own and have all that you have been saying, you would need a lot more text on the slide. So how do we go around that bad news? How do we go around me saying it's hopeless? Well, there are two ways. First, uh, make sure that you focus on the messages, on the so what, on the thing you want the audience to remember from each slide. And then the point is that you don't need to say everything on the slide. You just need to make sure that whatever you say, however limited it is, does not need additional information to be understood. Right? I said a lot more than what I show you on the slide. At the same time, if you take one of my slides and you don't listen to what I say, with maybe a few exceptions like uh, Snow White and so on, you'd be able to get my message without me. Not everything, but the message. So that already helps. If every slide stands on its own, no matter how little it might say, then you can use it more easily as a handout. Second, 
you can also think out of the box. And for example, if you're using PowerPoint, recognize that one feature of PowerPoint is called speaker notes. Well, you can say, let's use that, but not for speaker notes. Let's do that for audience notes. So you could say, I'm going to take my uh, US letter sheet. In speaker notes, the slide is going to come very small top left corner. And normally the rest of the space is for notes for myself. How about I use the rest of the space as notes for the audience? So when I give a presentation, I only show the slides with minimal information, standalone but minimum, just the message. But when I give a handout to the audience afterwards, I give the US letter sheets with the sliding small and the additional information they might need, possibly including Excel spreadsheets and what have you, that would be in the notes. I'm not saying it's the best document for reference afterwards, but it allows you at least to uh, establish some kind of photographic uh, recognition of the slides. They've seen the slides, they see them, they recognize them as something they have seen before. And I think that gets back to your concept of effective redundancy, where you're presenting people with multiple channels for accessing the same information, but ideally all of those channels are in alignment, so you're not presenting people with new pieces that are somehow in conflict or, or confusing a message that was given right. earlier. Excellent. So just to give people a sense of how we'll use the remaining time, I think I'll present Jean-Luc with one more question, and then we'll wrap up with a few more logistics about how you can see this video later and other such questions. So the final question is about potentially stretching the recommendations that you've presented today. So are there times when a long sequence might actually be more appropriate, such as if you have to communicate a, a journey or a type of process that's very long? Right. Uh, you could certainly argue that if the essence of what you are trying to communicate is sequential, then there's nothing wrong with a sequence. However, I have my doubts this time, maybe not so much in terms of how much the audience will remember, because maybe they don't need to remember, they have a document, but much more in terms of how well the audience is prepared. And one uh, example of that, let me limit it to one example, is what I see a lot, for example, in the pharmaceutical industry, what they call standard operating procedures, SOP. Basically, it's a recipe, and so you easily have a procedure in there with 21 steps. Now, even though they argue to me that you just have to follow with your finger top down in the document and do the steps one at a time, I feel that I'm never very well prepared, for example, because one step in there may just take five seconds and another step in there may take two hours. And I would like to know things like that in advance. In fact, if you look at recipes online, I mean, cooking recipes for your kitchen, you see that there is usually some sort of grouping. For example, you may have a group for the ingredients and then a group for the preparation and then a group for the cooking in itself. Similarly, when you buy a new piece of equipment and there is some assembly required, you may have groups as well. You may have a first category that is unpacking and checking the content, and then you may have a second category that is putting the electronics together, and a third category that is testing the electronic to see if it's really working. So even for something that's essentially sequential like a procedure, I still think there is a benefit in grouping. Now, do you really need to limit every group that you make in that procedure to exactly five? Maybe indeed, we may want to be a little more flexible, although if you ask me, I'm a purist, I'm a perfectionist, I will try really hard not to have more than five in every of those clusters. Thank you so much, that was really wonderful. And overall, the MIT Alumni Association would really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us today and for sharing your work with the MIT alumni who have joined us from around the globe. My and pleasure. I that, yeah, I hope that everyone found this mix of conceptual brain candy for us nerds out there, plus practical applications, a really engaging mix today. And thank you as well to our audience for tuning in today. So as a reminder, the presentation will be available on the Alumni Association YouTube channel under the Career Lunch and Learn playlist that will go up in about a week. And Jean-Luc, we also had the question of whether you would be willing to make your slides available to attendees later. Oh, slides uh, that would be difficult for copyright reasons that I have to respect. It's okay to show them in a webinar and the webinar will be online, but giving the slides separately, uh, I'd, I'd, be in difficulty. I really want to respect the, the copyright of some of the images that I've used, for example. Of course, that makes lots of sense. 
So apart from that, if you have any further questions about today's event, please email careers at mit.edu. And with that, thank you again to Jean-Luc and thank you to you all for tuning in. Have a good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.